everybody and welcome back to my channel. My name is Gita Mary and today is another impact video and it's kind of festive. I don't know if it's festive. It's actually not going to be that festive, but it's about chocolate and I thought December, Christmas, chocolate, let's ruin someone's holidays, shall we? And it wouldn't really be an impact video if we didn't start with a little bit of history. Now, when we think of chocolate today, that differs massively from the original use of cacao. And cacao, which is what chocolate is made from, is native to South America. Previous studies have found that the use of cacao dates back over 2,000 years, and many historians actually agree it's closer to 4,000 years. The first signs of the use of cacao were found in the ancient Mesoamerican civilization of the Olmecs, which is today southern Mexico. Studies also show that both the Mayans and the Aztecs brew a bitter drink made from cacao that was used in rituals and for medicine. These civilizations believed that cacao possessed magical or even divine properties and it was used in rituals surrounding birth and marriage and death. The Latin name for the cacao tree is Theobroma cacao, which literally translates to food of the gods. Now we're gonna skip ahead a little bit because I also want to talk about the introduction of cacao in Europe, which happened around the 1500s, because of what? You know what? Colonialism. <laughs> in the wake of human exploitation and slavery, Europeans brought cacao from South America to Europe, where it quickly became wildly popular. And where the traditional uses of cacao often involved brewing this bitter drink with spices and peppers, in Europe they quickly started to mix it with sugar and vanilla resources also often obtained from colonies. The entirety of Europe was obsessed with cacao and specifically chocolate. However, most people couldn't really afford it. It was a treat reserved for the higher classes and royalty, like Anne of Austria, the daughter of Philip III of Spain, who partook in the widespread custom of drinking chocolate for breakfast, or the wife of Louis XIV, Marie Therese, who centralized the supremacy of chocolate in the French court. In Spain, Philip V and Charles III saw the economic potential of trading cacao and created a monopoly between Madrid and Venezuela. This was one of the steps that would lead to cacao and chocolate use being more available to the wider public. And of course, that came with some consequences for the people to whom the cacao plant was native, because all of a sudden, such a huge quantity of people were demanding it. And sadly, I have been able to find alarmingly little about what this meant for people in South America. So if you do know more, please let me know. I'm also finding myself in a skeptical position because when reading these historic articles that are supposed to explain sort of why and how chocolate came to Europe, they always mention that Christopher Columbus was one of the great historical figures who brought chocolate back to Europe, among other things. And at best, these articles are putting him in an objective neutral light, which I know for a fact is an injustice. Heck this guy, let's continue. In Europe, a long time went by before chocolate was used in desserts and cakes. One of the first instances was with the publication The Art of Confectionery from 1747. The more modern chocolate candy bars first appeared in 1847, exactly 100 years later. By 1868, a little company called Cadbury was marketing boxes of chocolate candies in England. Milk chocolate hit the market a few years later, pioneered by another name that might ring a bell and who we could definitely also talk about in terms of sustainability and lack thereof, and that's Nestle. And from there, industrialism and capitalism did what they do best. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the production of chocolate, because I want to add a little bit of a clarification so we know exactly what we're talking about, because we can talk about chocolate, cacao, and cocoa, and they all refer to different processes and different states of the original cacao bean, because cacao is the tree, it's the pots, it's the beans, it's the seeds, everything that's unprocessed, once you process it, it becomes cocoa. And from cocoa, like cocoa butter, cocoa solids, you can make chocolate, which is the final product. The cacao tree is between four and eight meters tall and cacao beans and seeds can be found within pots. These pods are big oval fruits and one pod contains between 30 and 50 beans. One bean being basically the size of an olive. When the beans are harvested and removed from the pods, they have a natural bitter taste to them. However, the taste becomes sweeter during fermentation. The fermentation uses already existing bacteria and yeasts from the beans and it lasts for about a week. Then the beans are dry roasted to bring out flavor. After being roasted, the beans have their hull and inner nips removed through a deshelling process. The nips are ground into 
into a fine powder which releases the cocoa butter and creates a fine paste. Once solidified, the chocolate is ready to be eaten. Technically, this is a very raw, unsweetened chocolate product and it can technically be eaten, but it's often used as ingredients in other products and other things. And then you add way more things to it to make it like the chocolate bars that we know. The major producers and exporters of cacao beans are the Ivory Coast, Indonesia, Ecuador, Nigeria and Brazil. In 2016, the annual production of cacao beans was that of 4.25 million tons. In 2015, the worldwide sale of chocolate was estimated to be worth more than $101 billion, with Europe accounting for about 45% of global consumption. The global production of cacao beans increased by 32% between 2000 and 2014. Furthermore, the impact related to land use for cacao plantations grew by 37%, from 7.6 to 10.4 million hectares during the same period. The biggest contributors to deforestation is palm oil, soy, cattle and wood products, collectively responsible for about 40% of all deforestation averaging about 3.8 million hectares of lost natural habitat each year. And when comparing the chocolate industry to these four major industries, it's actually not that impactful per se, because the chocolate industry has only been responsible for about 2 to 3 million hectares of lost land between 1988 and 2008. And obviously this statistic has increased because chocolate production these last just 20 years, just 10 years, has increased a whole lot. So obviously it's going to be a bit more at this point, but it's still not as much as these 3.8 every year. Okay. However, the majority of the deforestation accounted for by the chocolate industry is concentrated in rather small areas, both in Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, particularly the Ivory Coast, Ghana, Nigeria, Cameroon and Indonesia. The factors that fuel these issues are related to poor legal systems and lacking government policies, as well as an increasing demand for cheaper cacao. Products. And with increasing climate change and all those consequences that come with the changing climate, the areas where we can grow cacao trees are getting smaller and smaller. While it sounds a little bit wild, the world will run out of chocolate if we keep going the way that we're going now, because we're actually consuming more than we're producing. There's also the notion that demand is increasing for chocolate, but actually more and more farmers are turning away from the chocolate industry because they're more profitable fields to be working in. A lot of farmers are losing a big part of their annual yield, both from dry weather conditions but also from diseases that specifically plague cacao trees, making farmers lose 30 to 40 percent of their annual yield. So yeah, not very profitable. Of course, because chocolate is made from trees, those trees will need water to grow. But there's also the notion that in the supply chains for chocolate, a little bit more than some water is being used here. Actually, it takes 10,000 liters of water to make one kilogram of chocolate. And that puts chocolate in the heavy end along with a lot of animal products. For instance, it takes about 15,000 kilos of water to produce one kilogram of beef. It takes about 5.5 thousand liters of water to produce one kilogram of pork. In comparison, about 800 liters of water can make one kilogram of apples. 2,500 liters of water can make one kilogram of tofu. And a little bit more than 200 liters of water can make one kilogram of tomatoes on average. So yeah, chocolate is definitely one of the higher impact foods. Cacao sourcing and energy supply is also a little bit of an environmental hotspot because many suppliers still need to opt for sustainable energy and that also increases impact. The overall global warming potential of chocolate ranges from 2.9 to 4.2. And I haven't talked a whole lot about global warming potential and what that really means, but it can be a really nifty thing to know a little bit about when reading environmental texts. So greenhouse gases warm the earth by absorbing energy and slowing the rate with which this energy escapes into space, so the earth gets warmer. Different types of greenhouse gases have different rates and different effects on the earth's warming, like how long these gases can stay in the atmosphere or how much energy they're absorbing. This is for instance why we're talking about methane being 25 times more potent than CO2 because with global warming potential CO2 is the default and then you compare everything else to that of carbon dioxide. It's basically just a unit of measure that makes it easier to compare different impacts across different industries and sectors and also compare different emission reduction opportunities. Now, when looking at the impact of a product, I think it's incredibly crucial to not only look at the environmental impact, which is, of course, important, but we also have to look at the social impact. This is what we've done with many of the other impact videos as well. And with the supply chains in the chocolate industry, we really have to talk about this.
because child labor and forced labor, aka slavery, has been a known problem in the chocolate industry supply chains for decades. All the major chocolate brands have been talking about how they are going to now uproot child labor in their supply chains for years and they have missed their deadlines since the 90s. More than 60% of the world's cacao production comes from West Africa, where a US Labor Department report found that over 2 million children are working in the industry. In 2019, representatives from Hershey, Marth and Nestle could not guarantee that children weren't working in their supply chains. And the reason why that is, is because the supply chains for these bigger companies are incredibly long. It, there's basically no oversight and there's basically no way of tracing a product back to a specific farmer. Mars can trace about 24% of their chocolate, Hershey can trace less than 50% and Nestle about 49 which leaves a lot of room open for exploitation. The average age for children working in the industry is 12 to 16, but several reports show many cases of children as young as 5 being forced to work. Furthermore, while these children are working, they don't have access to education and school. Child labor is a symptom of poverty, and when generation after generation is forced to work because otherwise they don't have food, they automatically can't prioritize education and that leads to generations and generations of continuous poverty because no one is able to break the cycle and that is aha not their fault it is because these billion dollar companies have the option to not pay livable wages so that these people can break the cycle so really it's not about shaming child workers it's not about shaming any workers in the supply chain it's about putting pressure both consumer, activist and political pressure on these companies to do better. Investigations have also found how children are trafficked into West Africa to work in these supply chains without pay which is slavery. According to International Labour Rights Forum, every research study ever conducted in Western Africa shows that there's human trafficking going on, particularly on the Ivory Coast. So we've been over the environmental impact, we've been over the social impact. Let's talk about how to make chocolate more sustainable and also how you can purchase and consume more sustainable chocolate. Roughly 23% of global chocolate in 2015 was certified with one of the four major labels, UTZ, Fairtrade, Rainforest Alliance or Organic, which is a significant improvement from the 11% of certified products from just 10 years earlier. Also, I've made a guide to the certificate so you can go and watch that if you want to know more about what they do, what they don't do and if they're actually effective. I go into detail a little bit more in that video than I will in this one. But let's get this straight. A certificate is a great place to start. Having a third party oversee your supply chain, having a third party make sure that there is no illegal activity going on, that the methods with which a thing is produced is up to standards, up to par, and that takes responsibility for its social and economic and environmental impact is a really good idea. However, it is not the only solution because it's not a 100% effective solution. It's not a 100% effective solution in terms of of combating climate change, nor is it in uprooting child labor or making sure someone gets a livable wage. For instance, even in fair trade supply chains, there is still detected child labor. It's also great to see the companies talk about sustainability and the social impact as well, but the transition to an actual more ethical and sustainable production is very, very slow. There's also the notion that when there is no political pressure to actually change your supply chain, you can promise a bunch of things when you're in the media headlines when people are talking about you and then there's no oversight, there's no upkeep, there is no consequence for not meeting the goals that you then try to set for yourself. And we can see that with the uprooting of child labor because again they've been promising the same things since the 90s and it hasn't happened yet. So next to consumers boycotting, next to certifications, it would be great to have the political system be engaged in this in a much more thorough way than what we see now. For instance, banning certain methods, but also making restrictions for companies or making it absolutely vital for these companies that they also support the communities that they're now exploiting. For instance, by requiring them to build schools or hospitals or pay for education for the children in their supply chains. You know, what we would call basic human decency, but I digress. In 2016, a study found that fair trade certified farmers in Ghana earned about $36 more than non-certified ones, which is a little bit more than 1% of their overall income. So yeah, there is still room for improvements, even in certified supply chains.
Now, if you want to do something both to help the farmers and also to decrease the impact, you can look at buying organic dark chocolate because the higher of the cocoa content in the product the more money goes towards the farmers and if you avoid stuff like dairy in your product then automatically that will also lower the impact if you have the option to you can also look at direct trade where a company and a farmer work together without any middlemen and without a huge and massively long supply chain that also definitely works out because the shorter the supply chain the more transparency there is automatically and that will make more sustainable and more ethical products also and this is kind of vital but reduce your consumption of chocolate especially in the west a lot of chocolate is consumed and like no one will die from lowering their consumption of chocolate just a smidge right so boycott your nestle's your mars your hershey's all these bigger brands and if you're going to buy chocolate buy from smaller companies and more ethical companies and speaking of ethical companies a lot of you guys requested that i included tony's in this video as well because a lot of you guys had questions about whether or not they actually were ethical whether or not they actually were sustainable so here's my verdict i don't know tony's advertised their products as being slave free which is nice. They also have smaller supply chains or like shorter supply chains. So it's easier for them to have an oversight and to actually know what's going on. There is still child labor in their supply chains. They have said this themselves and they have actually also showed reports saying that I think it was last year about 311 cases of child labor were detected in their supply chains and now they're working towards fixing that. So 100% ethical, not necessarily really the case. You can also still find a lot of the Tony's chocolates with dairy in them. There are vegan options as well, but not an overwhelming amount. It's definitely the better of the bunch. And if you were to substitute Nestle for Tony's, it would definitely be more sustainable. But I definitely also think that boycotting certain brands and reducing your overall consumption of chocolate is a good idea. Then buy a little less and make it a little bit better quality, a little bit more expensive so more people are getting paid. Obviously, even though they're not 100% effective, going for certifications is also a really good way to go about it. I don't buy chocolate that isn't fair trade. That's a really powerful thing we can do as consumers to make sure at least we are pushing in the right direction, even if it's not 100% the solution. But that's the case with everything, really. There isn't one solution that can fix the entire industry. We need to reduce our consumption. Industries need to take responsibility. From a political perspective, we need restrictions and laws that favor the workers and not the industries anyway this was the video i hope that you liked it if you did leave me a thumbs up and let me know down below your thoughts on this i would really love to hear from you if you want to know more about the impact of products services and materials check out my impact playlist where i have tons of videos just like this and uh, please consider subscribing to this channel that would make my day have a really amazing day take good care of yourselves and i'll see you guys next time bye Thank you so much for watching this video and also a special thank you to my Patreon supporters. You guys help me create green zero waste content and I love you guys. You can find the links to my social media accounts down below and the link to my Patreon on this screen. Bye!